Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming to this talk. So today I'll be walking you through uh, the, the challenges that we face as an Android developer when working with Lifecycle on the Android platform. And then we'll also be discussing what is the recommended solution and something called Lifecycle Components, which I don't know if it's the official name, but like I like to call them Lifecycle Components. So, but before we begin, let me, let me talk a little bit about myself. So, oops. So uh, I'm Nishant Shivasto. I'm an Android engineer at Soundbrenner. For those of you who don't know what Soundbrenner is, uh, we, are a, we are a wearable uh, domain company which basically builds uh, the vibrating metronome and the companion apps around it. So that's it. Uh, let's, let's jump right into the, the challenge that we face as an Android developer. So one of the things that is very uh, interesting is that the whole idea around a life cycle is very remarkable because you have these objects that live around for a certain time and then you have like those hooked in callbacks through which you can get the information back into them and then they are discarded over a period of time. But what changes over a period of time is that you have these configuration changes, then some of these objects would, uh, would, would just like go out of sync or maybe there's memory leak. So you have all these problems that crop up all the time, right? So the, the, the thing that has always like, like every Android developer is the Android activity life cycle, which is, this is what it looks like. It's taken from the developer uh, site and everyone knows about it. I think everyone knows about it, okay? Uh, the, the issue that we have always seen as is it has many states and then it becomes a bit more complex when, when you start go, go through a configuration chain and then you start going through these states multiple times. And that's not it, it's just the tip of the iceberg because we cannot forget there's a fragment life cycle too. So it's like inception, you have an acti activity life cycle, within that there's a fragment which has a fragment life cycle. And these, these life cycle events, they, they tend to like push Android developers to start putting their logic right into these like fragments and activities and then they e eventually turn out to be God objects, which is not a good thing. So, Sometime around like 2017, in, in, I think in Google I.O., uh, uh, Google announced something called the architecture components, which is what has like some small libraries, and it enables you to start working and architecting your Android app in a much simpler manner. But I'm not gonna be talking about all the other architecture components and all the libraries here, but focusing on the lifecycle components. Now, lifecycle components is a series of classes designed to help deal with life cycles in a more like consistent fashion. When I say consistent fashion, I'm trying to say that you define how it's going to work and you can follow that pattern in multiple other classes too. And that's not defined by some other, uh, say like the operating system or maybe like the OEMs of how you wanna call these. So those things exist and then there are like three classes which we'll be focusing on. So you have this class called lifecycle there's a lifecycle owner, and there's a lifecycle observer. So we'll go through them one, one at a time. Let's see lifecycle itself. So in the most generic form, what do you think is a lifecycle? A lifecycle is basically a series of states an object can be in, okay? And in our case, when we, when we deal with Android stuff, the object is basically something that defines the Android lifecycle, which translates to uh, activities and fragments. So, when, when, when I said series of states, think of it as an object that goes through the states that is, that is there on, the, on, these, uh, on this slide right now. So you have something that goes through an initial start, it gets destroyed or created, started or resumed. But then there are events that are fired within the, the uh, objects that have life cycle. So for us, in activity or fragment, you have the on create method that you override. That's an event that is fired inside the life cycle which is where you go in and you start pushing your code in to, to execute at that point in time when that event is fired. So lifecycle is trying to abstract the same kind of thing. It takes away that whole logic from within the activity and fragment and it puts them out into another object that you define it, okay? So when you want to include this in your, in your Android apps, you basically go through this implementation and add this as a dependency. The important to point to note here is that the support library since version 26.1.0 uh, already depends like on this lifecycle dependency and the app compat activity and support fragments like they implement the lifecycle owner. Now lifecycle owner is something that we are gonna talk 
later in the, in, the, in the session. So we'll just move up for this one. OK, so this is what a lifecycle class looks like. This is the source code. Uh, one thing to note is that everything that has the comment as source code is in Java. So those of you who have forgotten what Java is or is this a different kind of a language, just bear with me. There will be some Kotlin stuff too. So uh, this is the source code from the support library uh, and the architecture components. Uh, you see that the lifecycle class is defined as an abstract class. So what that means is that it can only be subclassed, right? So anything that has a lifecycle would be depending on this. It, it will be extending this lifecycle class, which is what the app compact activity and support fragment do too. And then you will notice then there are some methods called add observer, remove observer, get current state, is at least. Uh, we'll, we'll skip the add observer and remove observer for now because we are going to be talking about it later in the, uh, in the session. But what is important is the get current state and is at least. Now one of the things that keeps on coming up when you are doing this development is that you want to check out that is your application or rather just activity or fragment is in a certain state before you execute it. So sometimes you want to load something in your view, but then you have something called an on create, but then there's something called on view create too. So there are two different states. So you need to measure which version you're going to be doing that. So to abstract that logic away, you can literally say with this class that is it at least that the view is in the on resume state? It's uh, the, the, the fragment is on the on resume state because the view is already created by then, okay? The next class that we'll be looking at is the lifecycle owner, which is basically an interface that goes through the Android lifecycle. Uh, this is the source code, and, this is, and it has only one method. Uh, this method is called get lifecycle. Any, any class that implements this is gonna return or override this particular class to return you the lifecycle that it, it implements. So in our case, when we are going to be referencing in the support library, we know that support library right now implements the, the lifecycle owner. We just read that some time back. And then we can add observers to this lifecycle, which is called a lifecycle observer. But wait, there is a mistake here in the slide because my lifecycle observer is not defined. That's why it's in red. So, and I also have to do something here. Like in on resume, I have to add the observer, and in on stop, I have to remove the observer manually. We'll see how to fix that. So, fun fact that we have this, like we know fragments and activities, they have life cycles, right? But there is there is other classes that have also been implemented which have life cycles. And those are lifecycle services and process lifecycle owner. So in the most generic form, lifecycle services are the services that are also lifecycle owner. And this is what the source code looks like. Uh, it has all these different methods that you would expect it to have, like on create, on start, uh, and then on resume, on destroy, and on stop. But then because it implements the lifecycle owner, it also gives you back the lifecycle uh, a variable, and then you can add observers on the life, uh, life cycle states of this service. So just makes the whole process of abstracting the life cycle related information away from the service into your own classes. Okay, so this one is pretty important. I'm gonna be diving deep into the, into the source code for this. It's because it has a lot of nuances, which is not much clear for people. So process lifecycle owner is a class that tracks the life cycle of, we can say two ways. One is that it tracks the whole application process, or it takes all the activities and combined together, it tracks their life cycle. But the naming is a bit weird because when we say process life cycle, uh, it looks like it's tracking the process and the life cycle of it, but as a process, there are only two states that are possible for a, for, uh, to have in a life cycle. There's one creation and the other one is called like the destroyed or like it's just ended, okay? But that's not the case in, in Android because we have something as in the app goes into the background and it comes into foreground, which is what the process lifecycle owner does. So actually it should be called as like app uh, background foreground lifecycle owner, but it's called process lifecycle owner for some reason. I, I have no idea. To add this up, we have to include the lifecycle extensions uh, dependency. And it is important that you take note of this because I'll be talking about something that, that it does. 
But before we do that, let's, let's see how does the process lifecycle owner actually tracks the lifecycle. So the most common things that we will expect it to have is that the, it should have an on create, on start, and on resume, on pause, and on stop, and on destroy. But the difference is it, it works in a different way. The first difference is that the on create is called only once, and this happens when the activity, the first activity starts up, okay? And then the on start and on resume is called, which basically says that the, the first activity has now started, and it is in the on start and then the on resume state. So all these two events will be fired for the process lifecycle owner. So you, you get to track that. Now the next one is the on pause and stop, which is only called after the last activity has like finished doing work and has gone through its on pause and on stop state after the 700 millisecond. So what that basically means is that say for example, you have an activity, you opened it up and then you launch another activity from it, then the on pause and on stop would not be called because the other activity, it launched within the 700 millisecond delay. And then like there is, there is no, no difference in that anymore. So, and then the last one, on destroy is never called. It's because, as I told you, it's, it tries to detect the, uh, the foreground and background state. If it goes into the on destroy state, then there is no background state anymore. Like the app is just over. So that's why like the naming is weird, but the on destroy is never called. I wanna take a moment to like discuss what the after 700 millisecond delay does. So we'll go into the, into the uh, source code for this. So the process lifecycle owner implements the lifecycle owner as we will expect it. And then it has a final variable set it at a magic number, 700 milliseconds. So some people have argued that the 700 millisecond is like something that doesn't make sense, like how did you come up with this number? Uh, the point is that it's been like, I think it's already been tested multiple times by the, by the team uh, at Google, and they came up with this number after like multiple trials that 700 millisecond should be the de facto. Although in future, I think this might change because it, if, if an app is like super heavy and it does a lot of work, then maybe this time out time is too short for it. Uh, but it's final and there is no API for us to edit it. So we are like basically stuck with the 700 millisecond. Okay, uh, why do we actually do this thing, like use the process lifecycle owner? And like the, the, the on destroy, so, sorry, the, the, the delay is there for a reason. And that reason is that it guarantees that the process lifecycle owner will not send any events if the activities are getting destroyed or are recreated due to the configuration change. So an example would be, say for example, you, you open up an activity and then you close that activity, and then you open up another activity at the same time. If say for example, it, at this point, if there was more than 700 millisecond and the other activity hadn't started, the other one would get executed, then the process tracking that we are doing is wrong because now there are two activities and they are each being tracked differently. On the whole, process lifecycle owner basically wants to track all the activities at the same time. So that delay makes sure that all the other activities that are opening one after the other are not being tracked. But anything when it actually ends is when after the 700 millisecond, we don't expect any more activities to start up. And that's when we, we actually track the on pause and on stop states. However, this comes with a cost. As soon as you have added the extension, uh, uh, the artifact, it adds a provider element in your manifest file. And it's, it's problematic, I'll tell you why. Let's, let's see it in the manifest merger uh, uh, phase. What does our manifest file look like? So our manifest file basically has something like a content provider, and there's a class name called process lifecycle owner initializer. So we'll look at the source code for this too. It's an internal class to initialize the lifecycle. And in the on create of this particular content provider, the process lifecycle owner is getting initialized. So why is this a problem? Well, it comes with a side effect. It initializes process lifecycle owner even if your app does not use it. So it's like if you have the extensions artifact or dependency in your uh, like build.grader file, it's already initializing a, a, a setup of like lifecycles uh, owner, a process lifecycle owner, even if you don't need it. So it's, it's doing its work irrespective of what you want to, uh, you want it or you don't want it. But why would someone want to do that? Well, the idea was that it should be able to initialize itself as soon as the app starts, 
so that it can track the process or like multiple activities that are gonna start one after the other. Though it's, this is the only way of doing it right now because that's how you can do it. A content provider gets initialized as soon as the app is, is started uh, uh, because you define it in your manifest file. But this is what you will get as a side effect if, if you ever use the, the extension uh, library dependency. Now, this is something like a question that I've had sometimes when I wrote a blog post, and this is more related to like people asking me that, why do I even need the process lifecycle owner? Because I can obviously use application.activity lifecycle callback. For those of you who don't know that, let me, let me check out the source code for this, okay? Oh, also, the people actually try to pit it one, uh, other, one, one against the other, but I try to look at it as it's like an or case because I'll, I'll explain why, why this particular thing should be an or case. So the activity lifecycle callback has a source code like this, okay? And it has the on activity created, on activity save instances, activity destroyed, and all the bunch of other methods that you can expect it to be. It's a basic interface. And this is how you actually register it in your, say, activity or in your application file. This is how you will be able to track all your activities as they are getting created or destroyed. Now, keep, keep a look at this source code, and you will see that it actually is being used by the process lifecycle owner internally. So let's just dive into the process lifecycle owner source code too. When we look at the source code for process lifecycle owner, we'll see inside the onAttached method, there's something that is very similar to what we just saw for registering the activity lifecycle callback, which looks like this. And there's a different type of class that's called empty activity lifecycle callbacks. So we should check that out too. Why? Because, like, why are they even calling this? So turns out it actually implements the application.activity lifecycle callback. So the question about using application.activity lifecycle callback versus the process lifecycle uh, owner is actually useless because it's more about do you want to use a better API versus do you want to implement it on your own? This better API is actually using the same thing that you want to use it in a raw form. Okay. So after all of this stuff, we know there's the process lifecycle owner, we have a lifecycle service, lifecycle like an activity that already has a lifecycle and fragments. What if I wanted to create my own lifecycle owner, right? That's something that people will want to do it. If I want to have my own object that can control its own lifecycle, that would be great. So that's where lifecycle registry comes in. This class is also provided uh, by the lifecycle components. And it's basically like an implementation of lifecycle that can handle multiple observers. This is what the source code looks like. So you have a lifecycle registry, which basically extends lifecycle. And if you remember, lifecycle implements just one method, it's get lifecycle. So it's basically extending, so it has access to that too. The pain point to using this is that you have to dispatch the events yourself. So it's open in a way that you can create your own lifecycle owners, but the difference is that now you have to dispatch and tell when a certain event is happening. So this is how you do it. I'm gonna walk through this code, it's a lot of code I know, so but uh, bear with me, it's like, this is how you actually create a lifecycle owner. So the lifecycle owner, you have to extend it first so that you can get access to the, the get lifecycle method. And then you have to create a registry object, which is, you simply do it. This is all Kotlin stuff. I think most people will get it. And then you override the get lifecycle and then you return the registry. Why are we even doing that? Because the registry is the one that is holding, that, that's the reference that we are holding to dispatch our events further on. And this is how you actually dispatch your events. You dispatch it by like going through the, the handle lifecycle event method, and then you pass it the event itself. So in my case, I'm doing it at the time of initializing block. I'm passing it on create. And in my case of like say doing the start listening is when I say that on start lifecycle event needs to be fired. Once you have done that, this is the whole code that it looks like. We come back to our original uh, block of code that we were talking about first. And this time, we create our own lifecycle owner. We create a method of our own lifecycle owner. And we now reference the lifecycle method or property in our case because it's Scotland. Uh, we now reference it from that and then we call the add observer or remove observer. 
but we still haven't figured out the MySQL observer because I still don't have reference for it in my code, right? And that's a missing piece. So let's, let's jump into that and fix this code right away. So lifecycle observers are basically an interface for observing the lifecycle. It's an empty interface. I'll tell you why it does that. The, the reason it is empty is that it's basically marking any class as a lifecycle observer, and then it works alongside that particular marking with two different ways to, to tell when a certain event is happening. One of the ways is through annotations, and the other way is to do it through callback interface. If you want to do it with annotations, uh, you have to in include the annotation processor and the compiler for it so that it can generate the annotations for you. And the way you call it is that you annotate your methods with the right kind of lifecycle event you want them to be triggered at. So say, for example, right here, on, uh, when the lifecycle goes through the onCreate session, uh, that's when we, I want to trigger my init. So automatically, when my, life, when my activities lifecycle, or for me, my, my particular lifecycle owner's lifecycle goes through an onCreate, init method gets called automatically. The same goes for the, the onStart method and the cleanup method. They are getting called at the right time, at the right event in the lifecycle. So back to our own code. We have these missing references, and we now fill them up by creating a lifecycle observer. And as soon as you do that, now I don't have any errors in my code, and I can just pass them as an add observer and to the remove observer. Now, the problem here is that I actually have to do this manually, and I said this earlier also. At any point in time, if I add an observer, I have to remove it too. Because if I don't, I hold on to the reference of the registry, the strong reference that I hold, and that could lead to memory leaks. So it's on me to do that whole process. I have to do it on the on stop to remove the observer, and then in the on resume, add the observer again. So that's, that's, that's the problem that we'll be, that we'll be fixing in the, in the next uh, few slides. OK, so the, the first method that we talked about was the annotation processor thing. The other one is the callback stuff. Uh, and it is represented by the default lifecycle observer. It's basically a callback interface for listening to lifecycle owner's state changes. OK? And it is recommended over annotations if you're using Java 8. So what that means is that now you need to have the source compatibility compile option in your build.grader. If you don't have that, this is not going to work. And the way that you call this up is through by calling another dependency called commons.java-8. -java and it works pretty much similar to how we do a normal interface, OK? You implement it, the default lifecycle observer. But before I start implementing it, I actually want to look at this code to find out like what exactly is this. Like it's, it's some implementation of an interface that I want to see what method it has. So I, I opened up the source code, and I'm looking at this. So there's this default lifecycle observer, and it extends the full lifecycle observer. So we'll look at the code for the full lifecycle observer too. And you will see it's like a standard interface with some methods called on create, on start, and then till on destroy. So it's like something that's very basic. It's not some magic. It's, it's something that's already been there for us. It's just the, the team at Google, they just like abstracted all this logic, and they made, opened this up with APIs for us. So this is how you implement it. You basically just uh, implement the default lifecycle observer, and you override the classes. And when you override these classes, you can call the methods that you want to call in, at, at them. So you're not using any annotations anymore, which is good. OK, so I talked about the, play, uh, the, the problem of calling the add observer and the remove observer, which is nice, but not so much great, because I still am doing some manual work, and I don't want to do that. So that's where live data comes in. OK, so live data is basically a lifecycle aware base class for encapsulating loading data. That's like the statement for it. But in the most simplest manner, think of it, it's like a, it's like a wrapper around your data. And once you put that wrapper in, it, it becomes aware about the lifecycle. It knows when a certain thing is happening, when the on start and on resume is being executed in the lifecycle it is listening for. So it obviously is a, a lightweight implementation of the observer pattern, which you might have heard from the, from the reactive streams. To get this in, you have the live data uh, dependency that you can always call into your project, and you, can, you will have access to live data. 
but I wanted to go further and I want to check the, the source code for this. So I went in, I tried to check what the, what the live data class looks like. So it has a bunch of different methods, but what's important for us is the, is the, uh, is the live data class is defined as abstract class, so you can again subclass it, and you can't instantiate it. And then there is something called the post value, the set value, the on active, and on inactive. So post value is basically something that sets the value in the asynchronous manner. So you provide it a value, it will go onto the background thread, and it will set up the value in the live data itself. Like, it's like a data holder, so you're just like pushing values and assigning those values to it. Uh, the set value runs on the main thread, main thread and it, it puts the, or sets the value in a synchronous manner. Now these two are very important because that's where the magic comes in, and, and I don't have to now manually control or like put my remove observer or add, uh, add my observer in my lifecycle owners because on active will make sure that if I have active observers and they are going through the star, start and resume state, then it will execute a certain method for that time. So I'm not any more adding observers or removing observers because I know how many observers are there, how many active observers are listening for this data. And the on act, uh, inactive version will tell me when there are no active observers. So what that means is that inside the in, on inactive, I can actually unsubscribe my observer, and in an on active, I can subscribe to my observers, right? Like call the add observer and remove observer. And that way I can abstract the whole thing up. So a very good example for this is when you are trying to do some like getting data from a sensor. So we are gonna build our own live data right now. So let's think of it, there's like a class called my uh, sensor live data, and I'm passing it a context uh, variable, obviously extending the live data because it's an abstract class. Then I have the sensor manager and I have this on sensor event uh, listener. But the important thing here is that as soon as I come into the listener, I call the set value and the value of the event that I'm, I'm getting it from here. And once I've done this, I can go on and add or maybe register for my, for my particular uh, listener and I can unregister for my listener in the inact uh, on inactive and on active. That done, this is what my live data now looks like without using any add observer or remove observer. So I basically just declare it and then I directly observe on my like data whatever I wanna uh, look for and it keeps on feeding me data. When the activity goes into the on destroy state or on the on stop state, it unsubscribe from that life cycle. When it comes back into the on resume state, it subscribes back to it. So now I'm not controlling or like manually handling the, the subscription of the, uh, of the life cycle observer anymore, which is great because that's how I wanna do it. So this all works, it's all great, but then you have configuration changes and everything just like goes boom. It doesn't work. That's when view models come in. Now, view models actually aren't related to much like lifecycle and stuff because they are like the holders of, of data, okay? And this is what their version of lifecycle looks like. They just like persist through all the lifecycle states until the on destroy is called, and then they have another method called on cleared, which tells that the view model has to be, has to be deleted, okay? So they survive the configuration change. They prevent unnecessary relo reloading of data. And they actually hold on to this data when you do, like you rotate your screen or like you, the, the keyboard pops up or something like that happens. So why is this being referenced in this talk though? Well, the thing is that when you want to actually work with view model, you can combine this with live data to make sure that when you have these configuration changes, it holds on to this lifecycle objects, subscribes and unsubscribes, but still has that data available after the configuration changes happen. So to get this in your, in your project, you basically just have to call the view model dependency. And I obviously wanted to check the source code. I always check the source code, okay? So the Java version was there and I, I, I saw that it's an abstract class which has only one method that was important and it's called on cleared. It just tells that a view model is done, it's destroyed. And this is how I use it. I extend it. Uh, I, I extend it from the view model, and then I have my own live data, the mutable live data, which basically means that the data is gonna change. Uh, and then 
the username.value is the Kotlin version. The Java version would be username.set value, where I actually assign the value to the live data. Now, the important point here is that when I am trying to talk to the live, uh, live this view model, I return the live data here in the get username instead of the data. So I don't care about the data because I know view model is going to handle that for me. So what I'm doing is I'm asking it to return the, the live data object for me, which is what it does. And you have, you have, the, you have the live data and this is how you will be able to get it, like get the information out. So view models are instantiated by using a factory. Uh, they are called view model providers and you just like call them in this certain manner. Uh, this is how the API is designed. Okay, and then when you want to reference it back, you reference it from the view model. You call it view model dot, get me the live data, which is our get username, and then you observe on that data. Now we know that the view model is gonna persist through the configuration change, so that's what it's gonna do, and the observer is still listening and subscribing and unsubscribing on its own, so everything is happening automatically. And once I've put this code in my activity or my fragment, that's what I need right now. Everything else is being handled in the, in the uh, backend of this, this whole code running inside activity or fragment. So that's how powerful lifecycle components are. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff that I could cover in this, but I think this is too much uh, code and stuff. So I think I'm done with this. So thank you all. One thing I want to add is that there's more information that if you want to check out, uh, I wrote a blog post sometime back that is related to how you can make an Android library lifecycle aware. And then I also have some examples that uses process lifecycle owner for libraries and uh, lifecycle components for libraries. So maybe that you want to check it out. Thank wow, you. you stayed in time. Perfect. So is there any question? Because I think we could spare one minute for a question. the side and I'll give you the microphone. <laughs> so it's one final question because then you're out of time. Um, do I need to manually unsubscribe from the view model when the fragment or activity goes to the background or gets dismissed? Sorry, I can get it. Uh, do I need to manually unsubscribe from the view model when the fragment or activity gets dismissed? No, you don't. So the live data in itself is doing the, the subscription and unsubscription process. View model is just a holder of that live data. So it doesn't affect what happens with your activity or fragment. Because if it's going to persist through all the other lifecycle state. And it only goes away when it's on destroy state. So you are not leaking memory. You are not having any memory overheads or anything related to data getting like persisted in some different garbled manner. OK? Okay. Thank you, Nishan.